Good afternoon to all the viewers and listeners. It is a privilege to talk to these expert, uh, experts of this country interested in urban planning. And this session has come at a very opportune moment when we have just launched the Make in India uh, program in, uh, in a real implementable term just two days before. And urban areas are the canvas where this growth story of Make in India has to be written. In that context, I, will, I propose to present to you the framework for urban planning in the context of where we are today and where we should be going tomorrow. And this framework which I am going to propose will be on the following lines. We will discuss the status of urbanization in India, the perspectives and objectives of a smart city, challenges for planned urbanization, and the opportunities, the standards for smart cities as to what, how to define a smart city, what the smart city should aim at in measurable terms. And then I would wrap it up with some transformation visuals as to how cities have transformed themselves globally and in India with some examples. Friends, you are planners and you are interested in urban development in various ways. We hear so much that India is urbanizing very fast, urban areas are overwhelming the country, cities are getting overcrowded. But I think that that statement is not really based on a sound argument, I would say, because we are comparing our urban area with our rural area. Even then, urbanization level of 31%, it is shown here as 30, but it is little over 31% as per 2011 census. This level of urbanization is not at all very high as compared to other countries. I am not showing here European countries where it is of the order of 90% in general. I am showing the countries which we call you know, as comparable to us and most of these countries have become independent around the time we got independence with the, almost the same level of economic growth, urbanization level and everything. And their urbanization level, in fact China has now crossed 50% and we are 31%. In 2001 census, India's urbanization level was 28%. The growth in percentage point term is 3% over 10 years and it is not really high by any standard. And it is not, I am not saying just for the sake of comparison, but we should know that and the, all these countries have much higher per capita income, much higher levels of uh, infrastructure that is available to them. And these countries, we have to see that how they have progressed and within our country where the high, more urbanized states stand in terms of uh, prosperity. This is the next slide which will uh, tell us the uh, status of organization of states in our country and their levels of per capita income. And we have taken three year average of per capita income so that any aberration or any angularity spikes in per capita income for one year is neutralized by taking average. So 2011 census uh, is showing the organization level of states in the one uh, map and the other map which has got large number of red patches which shows the average per capita income. And you will notice a very high degree of correlation. The southern states and which I would say start um, if you can, I mean south of Narmada if you can say in some way, uh, western starting from Gujarat and then Maharashtra, and Karnataka, Kerala, uh, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and of course Goa in, in, in part of that region. These are the states with urbanization levels around 40 percent, slightly lower in some cases and higher in some other cases, around 40 percent. And these states have the highest per capita income. In very few statistics you will see such high degree of correlation. And the middle portion of India, ranging on one side from Rajasthan, then Madhya Pradesh, and Uttar Pradesh, and uh, Bihar, 
in uh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Odisha. These are the states that have very low level of urbanization. In case of Bihar, it is around 11 or 12 percent, and uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, about 20, uh, 22 percent. And other states are little more than that, but it is the lowest level of urbanization, and their per capita incomes are also the lowest. <clears throat> so this gives, and in fact, I would recommend to you to do a similar analysis for the districts in the state of your interest, that whether this correlation, which is around 0.7 to 0.8, is the, is the correlation coefficient. And we can see how this statistics uh, apply in case of uh, districts within a state, that more urbanized districts are they more prosperous. Uh, globally, that is true. More urbanized countries have higher per capita income. And uh, so this is a, a situation which we have to appreciate and we should feel proud of urbanization and not feel embarrassed about India urbanizing. Urbanization offers opportunities. Of course, by urbanization I mean planned urbanization. Urbanization, if it is a haphazard urbanization, uh, that naturally it will have its fallout and as we had all these years. But we are talking of urbanization in a planned manner, which is the way it has to be. And, and so in the, in the planned urbanization has been refined, the concept has been refined to be called as a smart city. And uh, the smart city world has come originally from European countries where they were, they, they have reached all the levels of infrastructure has reached certain level the roads, the water supply, the sanitation and the street lighting all have reached the required levels in terms of availability and uh, in terms of uh, uh, sustainability. Now the question for them was how to make it more efficient, how to make it you know, more easily approachable and accessible by the uh, user citizen and so they wanted to use ICT because and they are short of population anyway. And so, and technology is available, and research work is making technology more and more user friendly. So, these, these developed Western countries, particularly the European countries, they devised this term of smart city, like you have heard of smartphones. The phone was already there. To make it more user friendly, it was made smarter. And similarly, they used the word smart city to make the cities more user friendly in terms of uh, ICT enability, enabling environment where everything can be accessed much faster. But in our country, the challenges are little deeper and wider in the sense that our basic infrastructure also is to be improved, like the roads in city roads, city uh, water supply, sanitation, and uh, the street lighting, city bus services, all these have to be put in place physically in many cases to a certain, not to a normal level of uh, acceptability. And then the issue of uh, ICT uh, to make it smarter further will be there. So it is not to say that we don't require the concept of smart city is required, but even to develop the infrastructure, ICT can help. The framework for a smart city has to be much wider in our country as compared to the developed countries. And we need not straight away copy. And if you copy that, then we will feel that you know something is going wrong somewhere. It is our fundamentals have to be appreciated by us in India's context. Now having said that, let me say that the smart city, the definition within our country or in any country will be viewed by different uh, segment experts in different ways. See for example an economist, of you who are the economists or who, who view the smart city from an economic perspective would define a smart city as money spinner. A city which generates wealth is a smart city. Like human beings, we say, no, this guy is very smart, he made a lot of money in a short time, he's a smart guy. Similarly, a city will be called by many people as smart if it creates wealth. But then the architect will say that, okay, money some people have, but look at the shabby structures. If the structures are not, you know, signature structures, well-designed structures, the architect will never appreciate it. So from architect's point of view, well-designed structures will define a smart city. On the other hand, a town planner will say that, it should be well planned city from all angles. Then only it will be like there should be good roads and there should be, you know, <coughs> a good water supply and so on and so forth. 
and there should be suitable spread of habitation across the city and water bodies should be well preserved and so on. Well, technologists will focus on ICT, I said before, that the information and communication technology will make a city smart from the technology point of view, high uh, level of high degree of uh, application of uh, uh, ICT geospatial technologies or other ICT applications will make the city smart from a technology point of view. A sociologist, on the other hand, will say that social equity is very critical to make a city smart. Social equity will include in terms of uh, any kind of uh, uh, analysis you do of society, whether in terms of age group, uh, the elderly versus youngsters, men versus women, rich and poor, and you know any kind of uh, polarized analysis we do, and sociologists would be comfortable to make declare a city as a smart city if the society has equity in various forms. The environmentalist, on his part or her part, would say that a green city is a smart city. If the city water bodies are good, uh, the, the green part of the city is retained, not only retained but nurtured as green and uh, boulevards and hillocks and so on are preserved, nurtured, then according to the uh, environmentalist, the city will be a smart city. Can we say that only one or the other of this uh, definition is, is right to define a smart city? And I would suggest that the, the planner for a smart city should integrate all these concepts and make a city smart in terms of all these factors and some more also as we go along or as you would have felt over time that to make a smart city in real terms. So as I said that in, in some other country smart may mean only ICT but in our country the dimensions will be much more than merely ICT which is necessary but not sufficient. So when we are talking of urban planning for uh, making cities smart and uh, I would say that is a smart city should concept is for all cities big or small <laughs> even I would say for villages also it is a city word we are using because that is uh, that connotates some kind of uh, focus development area but the concept has to be applied to all habitations and a smart city what is the objective of the smart city In the perspective we have seen but when we are designing a, a project for a smart city, and I would say that kindly don't, don't think of linking it with the mission on a smart city, which is giving very good ideas, but then we should, we should not think that, okay, that mission, smart city is only for those cities covered under the mission, and those cities should work only according to what is said in the mission. I mean, we can define in our own way, our own habitation, which is a village or which is a small town or a medium town or a big town also not covered under the mission on a smart city, we can still work to make it smart. And while doing so, we focus that whatever we are doing, it should have the components which are mentioned here, say seven components are indicated. The first is that it should be efficient. Whatever we do in a smart city, any aspect, whether it is transportation system or it is the public services of any kind like payments to be made for your dues, complexity or water or obtaining any certification, approvals, we should see that the system is efficient in two ways. One is in terms of time and the second is money. Whatever time we have to spend to get should be as low as possible to get as much return as possible in terms of getting the services of any payments to be made, etc. And similarly money also. We should not be spending money for what is not worth spending. For example, to download an application form or to submit an application form, if it is done online, which is happening now in many more and more cases, then it is efficient because just to get an application form, if you have to go somewhere and procure the form, which is worth one page form, I mean, there's nothing there except some printed material and so on, it is not worth at all in today's time particularly. Now it's spending its money worth, whatever it may be, maybe one rupee or it may be ten rupee. We do it online free of cost, that is worthwhile. And so it is, this is the way efficiency has to be defined. And the whole smart city, every service must be transparently available. The procedures must be predictable and it should be known to people as to how to get your approval. You want motor driving license, what are the procedures? Before you apply, you should know. Are you entitled for the motor driving license? 
or you want to have your building plan sanctioned, what are the conditions for and what is the procedure for getting the building plan approved should you propose to invest in a uh, construction of a property and so on. You want to start a shop, what are the licensing procedures, conditions of getting license, during the uh, period of uh, continuity of the license, what are the obligations, rights and obligations of the licensee. These things need not, we need not depend on, uh, you know, somebody to tell us, it's predictable, I should know that. If I need this uh, approval, if I need this license or so on, this is the procedure I have to follow. That makes the things transparent. Then we have to have sustainability. And sustainability has got four aspects, which we will see financial, social, and in fact we can add uh, one more also and we will see whether I think in the next slide, we will come to that slightly later about the sustainability which which only will make the project amenable to public-private partnership. And in the, the smart city has to be inclusive, which I defined earlier in terms of social terms, that infrastructure, information and services should cover one and all. Uh, one and all, all those who need to access that infrastructure, that information and that service should be able to access it with almost the same comfort. For example, you have to board a bus, city bus service. Are the physically disabled person able to reach, enter the, reach the bus station, navigate through the procedure of procuring ticket, boarding the bus, sitting inside the bus and then deboarding and so on. As quickly in the normal course with the only slight difference if at all with the normally abled persons. Similarly, are the women able to feel as comfortable in accessing public services and infrastructure as the men? Similarly, are the children safe in accessing the infrastructure and like the children have to go to park or go on the street, go bicycling on the roads? Are they safe? Are they able to do everything whatever safely and comfortably? This makes the whole thing inclusive so that it is not, it doesn't become the infrastructure etc. do not become you know, available only to few or most conveniently available to few uh, as compared to others. Then the smart city should aim at becoming safe also. And safety has got three primary dimensions. Then first is the crime. Against crime the city should be safe and planners should design the streets to be say reasonably straight so that there are no unsafe corners and uh, there should be proper pavements and of course managers have got a role to maintain that planners do a nice job but even if managers don't manage it then it doesn't it may not survive it give the best results so the crime being the first part of safety the second part is the safety in terms of diseases contagious diseases then city should be safe and we are hearing like uh, at times outbreak of one or the other disease, sometimes chikungunya, sometimes we say dengue and so on. So that city cannot be called a smart city and there is something wrong with the planning but since we are talking using the word as planning I am saying but the equal responsibilities on the managers but let us use the word planning for today's discussion and extend it uh, after the discussion in course of time for the manager part also. So crime and disease are third the disaster issue. The city should be safe in the in the, in the context of disasters, which are both could be a fire is a major issue for cities, and we recently heard the fire uh, problem uh, fire issue that happened in the in Mumbai, and uh, the flooding uh, floods which happened uh, recently in Chennai, and there are many more cases of natural disaster. We have not forgotten many many in the recent times. And so the city should be able to overcome and stand up. In case there are disasters are happening, uh, fire also I would say, in many cities, developed countries also are facing disasters and uh, fire they may prevent to an extent by better planning and better management. But natural disasters are often beyond control. But how the city is able to reduce the impact of disaster on the well-being of the safety of the citizen and how it is able to stand again on its feet. That is the definition, that is the hallmark of smartness, good planning and smartness of planning and management of the city. And there are many cities which face flooding all over in Europe also and in Japan also. 
you hear of and even US also you see snowfall happen, huge snowfall in Nepal, two feet snowfall we heard recently in some parts of the US but life generally went on okay and recovery was very fast. So that is the hallmark of uh, smart planning and smart management of the city. Then the smart city should aim at being competitive. Competitive not only among the cities but for the citizen every service should be available as far as possible in a competitive mode. See electricity for example, you should not be beholden to one electricity supplier. Just like in mobile telephony, there is an extreme degree of options available. You can choose one or the other. And that competition has brought out so much of uh, uh, good qualities, better quality service, though of course you can, you feel like call drops are an issue even now and so, but having said that, as compared to, you know, when we had, we did not have the mobile telephony and we are depending on landline phone, phones only, compared to that and today there is a whole lot of difference. It has come because of the choices, competition, market competition brings in, uh, improves the efficiency of the operators and operations. And uh, similarly, the transportation system, we should not be beholden to one transport service only. And the more we are, I mean, you can go and give example after example. It is a complex thing to begin with, to do for everything. But wherever possible, we can do that. And there are concepts like you should have a trunk line supplier different and then service, actual service provider, good supplier is different. And so these are the basic concepts of uh, providing choices to people in civic services. So you can try. The smart city has to try and move on that. And then <coughs> the city should look beautiful also. The planner should make the city beautiful in terms of defined skylines. It should not be like one very tall building followed by just uh, a very short old building and followed by another middle uh, type of building with different kind of uh, uh, facade and uh, looks, <coughs> urban form. So there should be a defined urban form of the city. We should feel that we are in this city. We are in a proper city and so on. And last but not the least, the beauty should come from the heritage of the city also. Heritage is very important. Every city has got a soul and the soul has two primary dimensions. One is the social which includes cultural and uh, historical. That is one heritage. And the second is the natural which nature has given. So social has come by man's own historical trends and efforts like our own uh, the structures are there, forts, temples, mosques and so on, and churches and then we have got signature buildings of old times, our customs are there, the traditional building structures, house, houses of particular type being made in certain areas. This must be preserved. The city should not overwhelm, uh, get overwhelmed by the uh, concretization process like you are noticing that, uh, see the Fly, flyovers are like similarly all over every city is making its best effort to develop more and more flyovers and here and there you find uh, metro rail viaducts also and it is like individually we are working on that and therefore the cities are becoming concretized and you are not able to distinguish whether you are in A city or B city or C city most cities start looking similar and therefore it is necessary to have the city uh, decide on its uh, beauty in terms of heritage look and whatever heritage it has inherited so to say preserve that if building styles are a particular type then building should be of that type as far as possible i mean we cannot remain static in terms of time but then we should not completely lose our identity i mean i would like to put it this way because of the uh, uh, i would say that uh, inadequate uh, attention given to our heritage and then natural heritage. We have ponds, lakes, boulevards and even mounds and you know undulations in the terrain which define an area. I mean you see that the areas are defined like if you go to Deccan area, Bangalore or uh, areas in that side there, there is a particular look that city traditionally had. And if you uh, come to uh, Rajasthan cities, there is a particular terrain, particular look come to Bengal, the cities and towns had a particular framework, go to Assam, uh, and the, there are like 
water bodies around in the backyard or courtyard of the houses there are water bodies and so that kind of it is part of the nature nature has provided enough water in some areas and nature has provided you know very low availability of water or green and the, the nature has also compensated with some other way the looks of the city so those things have to be preserved and that will make the city smart not merely you know copying putting same stamp of one city over the other now we talk of sustainability which i left here we will see that in the next slide as to how we define the sustainability framework which has got five dimensions on four the financial sustainability environmental sustainability technological sustainability managerial sustainability and social sustainability the sustainable financially sustainable project is one which is able to generate capital expenditure requirements and operational expenditure requirements by itself now it seems little you know a doubtful concept as to how a road project can pay for itself can toll can you levy toll on the city roads which is not the case here you cannot levy toll on city roads but then when a road is developed well the property values go up economic activities improve and therefore there is an incremental revenue incremental prosperity which comes about in that area surrounding the in the influence zone of that road and therefore the incremental revenue should be garnered partly to meet the capital expenditure because had it not been incurred the economic growth would not have happened and now that has happened see whole lot of economic growth is coming up and part of that should come by way of one or the other uh, methods whether it is you will see more of this in a later slide as to how it can be done and operational expenditure also the users have to pay and everything need not be direct there are beneficiaries of the project who are not direct users but beneficiaries indirect beneficiaries in rupee term in financial term so they must be made to pay back for capital and for the operational expenditure and we will see more of it in a subsequent slide then sustainability in environmental terms would have two dimensions of time and space respectively in terms of time we should not do something which makes the area look good today but we are creating problem for the next generation we should not look, you know clean up something and pay for it later that will not be environmentally sustainable and similarly in terms of space that you clean the frontage of our house we clean and dump the waste in some other part of the city or outside the city in a in a, in a village and then we declare that my neighborhood has become very clean that is not a sustainable thing environment and so the sustainability has to be both in terms of time and space equilibrium has to come everything should look good as good as before if not better than before in environmental term then is the technological sustainability which again is very critical and you remember that some about uh, 25 years ago when computers were introduced in a, in a in a big way and in my office and many offices computers were brought in and very soon they found that you know either people were not able to handle that or these became out of date very soon newer models came and people did not you know could not handle it and many a time those uh, systems were not uh, fitting in the existing uh, environment in hardware concept itself and many of these machines could not be put to good use as good use as these were expected to and same is the case with software if hardware and software are on a stand alone type in terms of time or in terms of space and they don't integrate with what is happening around then they do not remain sustainable if they are welcome at the time of uh, the procurement but very soon they are uh, they become out of use and you we should try the this is the any concept smart city we are talking smart planning we are talking but this holds good of course as a concept for everything then we talk of managerial sustainability this will no perpetual dependence on the vendor there are modern concept which are brought in by most uh, efficient manufacturers and vendors and installed also but soon these are these vendors because they they are here to 
sell the product and they want to move on to develop new products and to sell new products. Very few of them have the patience or the capacity and may not be, may not be worthwhile also in terms of cost effectiveness. So to engage them forever to manage the system and therefore the local capacities will have to be developed to manage the new technology in whatever way it comes, then only it will become sustainable. And lastly, social sustainability, which is again very critical. We develop any project, there is general saying that for uh, majorities gain, some people will have to lose. But I would recommend that a development is a true development if there are no losers. That is because urban development particularly, urban development creates wealth. And if it is not creating wealth, it is not a development. It is not a development in true sense of the term. And when it is creating wealth, then where is the question of losers? That wealth has to be distributed well. That whole economic growth must become inclusive. There should be no losers, much less there should be no left outs. And that is possible. See, for instance, if we are making a road, then there are examples and examples in this, our country only and elsewhere also. If you are widening a road, if at all, and widening a road has issues of uh, uh, dimension of keeping the interest of uh, walkers and cyclists, uh, uh, keeping aside for a while. If you are developing a road and people have to lose their shops because you are on the roadside, develop good shopping area, allow them to do their business there in a systematic way. If you are developing a bus station, Somebody has to lose his business because the bus station is taking away the land. In the bus station, develop shops also and develop in a way that you know they can get better business than before. Not only same, but better business than before. So there is no, there should be no question of uh, losers or people who are left out of the, and the, all the projects should take care that everybody, then only it is sustainable. And when this kind of sustainability is ensured in the project feasibility itself, then only the project should be floated for public-private partnership. Because in the absence of a all-round sustainability, the project, even if the promoter, that is in, in our case, in our example, we can say the government itself will find it difficult to retain it for long, but then your government has larger capacity to, uh, to, to absorb any fluctuation in the fortunes of a project but a private partner will not be able to handle because he would have normally taken loan from the market, from banks and then he will have to <coughs> suffer serious situations and you hear there is so much of non-profitable uh, non assets or uh, it is a sinking assets are mounting in the banking system as per the recent newspaper reports. So let us not rush to push whatever is not sustainable or not designed to be sustainable on the shoulders of the private partner because it will be more difficult for them to manage the project in the longer run. As many examples have also uh, come in our, uh, before us in the recent times only in various sectors of infrastructure including urban infrastructure. Now friends having discussed the framework of urban development we will see the challenges with the urban development urbanization is facing and what are the solutions. Every challenge, I would say, has got a solution and I am not here to only highlight the challenge but we should not ignore the challenge but we should also recognize it and then find out the way to overcome it and convert into a situation of benefit and profit for the society. So first is the economic contribution of cities. We have to, those who are in the field of urban planning and urban development, they should feel convinced, they should be convinced to themselves that urbanization is good for the country. I gave one example before at a, at a macro level and which again here is over 60% of GDP of the country comes from urban areas. And you know we have ignored urban areas for far too long. From independence onward somehow we were reluctant to urbanize. Planning, urban development, investment in urban areas, planning for urban areas was done half-heartedly. We did not want people to come to cities. As a result, population remained in the rural area and the land holdings came down from 3 hectare in 1971 when first agricultural census was taken up to less than 1 hectare now. The square holdings 
will definitely make the farmers vulnerable. With all the good intention that government is trying to support, but the fundamentals we have to appreciate as planners, that we have to encourage people to come to city and then allow them economic, uh, to partake economic growth potentials and people who remain in agriculture should be only those who accept agriculture as an efficient economic choice and not as a kind of, you know, their helplessness, they have no other option but to remain in the village. That should not be the case. People who are good at agriculture, who, who feel proud to be an agriculturist and who are committed to work, they only should hold the agricultural land, not just because they have inherited and they have no other option, but that is possible only if cities are planned to facilitate migration. And to do that, you have to also, the, those who are, you are all experts, and try to estimate the GDP of the city, for which the framework, there is no data available for GDP of a city. And we have got the framework available in the URDPFI guidelines and then you have got the uh, sixth economic census which was done only a couple of years before. Household survey was done for economic activities. Using that, try to generate the GDP of a city data. I am sure <coughs> you will do a human service, those who do that. And the cities should take up, the city managers, the researchers should work out the GDP of a city and that will mean and prove to the people that, okay, per capita, how much is the return the citizens of city are giving and how much they need support to do still better. The second challenge is in develop growth of informal towns. While urbanization is the natural trend of development, and uh, but see how it is, what is the form of urbanization in terms of settlement patterns. The number of towns from 2011 has grown by from 5,161 to 7,933. So this is extreme growth, but 90% of this growth is driven by census towns. Census towns are such towns which have got all the characteristics of being declared to be a town, but being retained as village because they have not been notified to be a, a town under the state municipal laws. And these towns remain aloof of planned development framework of standards of uh, social services and so on. So number of census towns are as high as 267 in UP which has got I think 635 or so towns out against that. 267 towns are waiting to be notified as municipalities. And then Delhi has got, you know, Delhi is for a, a, a regional planner or for an urban planner. Delhi is fully urbanized. But in technical terms, there are villages, as many as 110 villages in, 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 in Delhi and Rajasthan and so on and so forth. So our challenge is to analyze the status of census towns. What is the population pattern? Those who are in the research field should highlight, analyze and then highlight the status of census towns and what potential they hold. And those who are in administration should follow it up with notifying the census towns as statutory towns, bring them into the framework of development. And then look at the uh, uh, another interesting data which has come from census is the uh, growth pattern or the scale of growth of towns of different categories. We have class 1 town of 1 lakh and above population that is one category and class 6 towns which are less than 5,000 and uh, 10,000, 10, 10 to 20. These are the classification. You see the interesting thing is we say that Delhi and Mumbai are getting overcrowded, Calcutta is getting overcrowded and so on. But reality is, statistics shows a somewhat different picture. The growth rate of Delhi in population term had always been of the order of 50% in 10 years. 1951 to 61, 61 to 71, 71 to 81, 81 to 91 and even 91 to 2000 of the order of 50%. Now, the last decade, it has grown by half of that. Same is the case with Greater Mumbai, which used to be 25, 20 to 30 percent growth rate for decade to decade. Now, it has come to 12 percent. Kolkata is growing at, grew at the rate of 6.8 percent over 10 years. Whereas, you see the class 1 cities by 30, close to 35 percent and smaller towns are growing by leaps and bounds in terms of population growth. And the unfortunate situation is that Smaller towns don't get that much attention where people are migrated. They are neither village 
where they used to get, you know, as in our dream, it is their village means clean air and so on, clean water, which I doubt whether villages are getting clean water by natural clean water anymore. But anyhow, all the clean air at least, but then the position is that people in the town, small towns need great attention, greater attention than what they are getting because small towns are holding increasing number of migrant population. The next challenge is the differential between the urban and rural system. This dichotomy, this distinction between urban and rural is also <coughs> needs a rethink. You know, we have got different standards for quantum of water that should be made available to a city of 135 liter per capita per day, for rural area less than that. Power supply should be like, there should be nominal power cut in city area, rural area can have higher power cut. The schools should be at least half kilometer uh, for every child available at half kilometer, not more than that in urban area, it can be one kilometer in rural area and hospital all similarly. This distinction is no more valid. People have got same expectation, <coughs> same aspirations and uh, then in village or, or in village or in urban areas and so this distinction is needs a rethink now. It is said that solid waste management is very important for urban areas, sewage management for, but for rural areas we are not talking with that kind of uh, focused, uh, you know, kind of deliberations, which is also not very much justified. And uh, then, of course, the Swachh Bharat mission is applicable to all, no doubt. But then the popular perception is to be also appreciated because our working style, our functioning is influenced to an extent by our social thinking or our general belief also. Then property taxes and user charges. The general perception that city areas will have to pay property taxes. Rural area, no property tax is payable. If at all payable, some nominal 5 rupee, 10 rupee kind of thing. It is also believed that what for water and uh, serv uh, sewage services or solid waste services, urban areas should pay user charges, but rural area, it should be nominal, like again 5 rupee, 10 rupee kind of thing, no metering, no you know volumetric charges, and urban area should be so. Development control regulations are supposed to be there for uh, urban areas, for rural areas, it's supposed to be free for all. Pay some small, vague regulations and you can develop anything. So outside the city areas, you find massive developments taking place, haphazard way, and when you ultimately end up including that as a city or town, then you end up having uh, you know, winding roads and impossible to have proper transportation systems and so on and so forth. And the unfortunate that the laws are different, we have got different municipal laws, panchayat laws are different and there are many laws which are, you know, differentiating between urban and rural areas without adequate justification. The states have got different departments for urban development to rural development, government of India has got different ministries. I think a time has come to relook at all these things and globally it is happening also, but let us look in our own context, the justification for perpetuating this differential between urban and rural system and try to remove it unless we are very much convinced in some cases, which I find it difficult to justify for myself. <coughs> Cities and in the surrounding areas depend on each other and there is a, a integration is required. And those who are into planning field, <coughs> they should focus on country planning also in town and country planning department. Those who are doing research should focus on equal attention to be given to rural and urban area, not merely, you know, not saying that I only merely look for urban, not rural. That may not be justified anymore. Then we come to housing. You see, census again throws beautiful figures. I am giving you national figures, but I would recommend that you please take a focused uh, area like not only a state, but a city you can take up and see because data of census is available through household census. It is available for even city wards and the household data is available, so you can use it. But having said that, nationally, the urban area, if you see, there are 11 uh, crore housing units uh, enumerated and only 9.9 .9 were occupied and as many as 1.1 which amounts to 10% of the housing units are vacant. It's a very high number. And, I mean, you see also, it is not that all are habitable. Some are also, they require to be improved, they are dilapidated because of rental laws, because of many things are there. That one side. But there are issues of connectivity, safety, security. So you go around uh, the city is uh, just outskirt of the city, houses of all kinds, you know, middle level, middle income group houses, lower income group houses, and developed in away from the main core city and they are not occupied for years together. And so these remain vacant houses while we have got the 
challenge of providing housing for everyone. So this has, and also it leads to informal settlements are growing on one side and vacant housing on other, including EWS houses are often not occupied. <coughs> this is, and slum population has continued almost unabated, around 18% it was in 2001 census and the same percentage has continued to around approximately in 2011 census also. <coughs> the challenge is to identify vacant houses in the city and plan how to put them to use. Rental housing is one option. Can we negotiate? Can the city government negotiate with the developers of the property? Sometime it may be developer, maybe development authority, and sometime it may be a private developer. Can we negotiate with them and develop a rental housing framework in which the developer gets a assured return, reasonably assured return from vacant properties, and <coughs> the, the citizen get a proper housing? You have to provide good uh, road connectivity, transportation connectivity, and safety and social infrastructure. All those things the city government will have to provide in collaboration with the developer. I think it should be given a fair chance and then <coughs> housing, uh, then it may work out also. And the flooding etc. has to be seen that people are safe there in terms of uh, crime, diseases and uh, flooding and so on. And it is, I believe that it can give a good solution and it will help us in achieving our mission housing for all. Then the next uh, challenge is the institutional labyrinth for urban planning. There is a multiplicity of authorities operating in the city under different statutes and quite independent of each other. They can take decision without a formal concurrence of the other and uh, these people are having shorter uh, patience now and therefore we are looking for, you know, there are models which say that if you do not give your yes or no in 15 days, authority doesn't give, then it is taken as yes and so on. So these are the one kind of uh, solution but other thing is to have a single window of uh, convergence. You know we see that uh, <coughs> master plan can provide that convergence. The master plan if it provides for whatever different statutes require should be incorporated in the master plan itself. Often the master plan say that this part of the plan is to be regulated as provided prescribed by that authority. So the master plan remains a loose document and therefore if you have to take approval of certain development under the master plan, you read the clause and go to that authority who has got his own master plan under that statute whether it is it is like uh, a <coughs> road plan or whether it is a transportation plan or environmental plan or uh, form for uh, urban arts or urban form and so if the master plan integrates all those regulations then definitely it will be a framework canvas for uh, single window approval. That even if it goes to some other authority for approval, by law it is required to go, but they will have no difficulty in clearing it very fast. So that master plan will have to be done with greater comprehensiveness uh, to help reduce the institutional labyrinth syndrome. Then the next challenge is the drainage issue. We talk of, I mean, Chennai floods, we, we have we still fresh in our memory and just a few a short while before that uh, Mumbai floods and then there are local floods in almost every city when it rains pours heavily on some days and because the drainage, natural drainage systems have been you know, <coughs> damaged and uh, encroached upon uh, in the development process uh, in the absence of proper master plan and it is said that almost uh, oh, not even 25 percent of the cities have master plan. You know I said that out of uh, say <coughs> almost uh, I would say 9,000 cities, towns only 5,000 are notified, sorry 4,000 are notified as, out of 8,000, 4,000 are notified as statutory towns and almost equal number is not notified. Whatever is notified for the, of that only 25% or even lower has got statutory master plans updated and in position today. Most are not having updated or no master plan at all and as a result the drainage system is the first casualty. The people are, you know, living on side of drainage and you regularize uh, in situ kind of development, though of course the guidelines do not encourage that. But even so, people are doing all their best in the absence of other uh, facilities. Uh, they are damaging the natural drainage courses leading to flooding of the cities. There are umpteen examples, water bodies are being trampled upon. They are encroaching or you know, <coughs> draining out the water bodies and making development on top of that. So where the water will go? Natural water will flood the area. See, so storm water should nurture the water bodies, encourage that way. 
allow the storm water to flow well by using the GIS uh, maps to identify the natural water courses, notify those under the master plan to be protected and then see that the rain water flows into the surface water bodies, not to, the, not to subsoil water immediately. First, it must go to the surface water bodies like you know, rivulets and lakes and ponds, which itself will uh, recharge the aquifers. In case thereafter surplus is there, that can go underground, but not the other way around. Sewage system should not flow into the storm water system at all. And we should have separate uh, sewage. I will say a little more about sewage system, how to manage it uh, in a way that it doesn't go into storm water drain system without too much of cost. You know, money should not be the primary criteria. Solution should be the primary criteria. And urban development doesn't require extra money. It at best it requires in one-time investment, which can come from uh, uh, as, a, as a loan from one or the other sources. But then that has to be paid back from the project itself, which we discussed before, and might I might be getting time to discuss with you a little later today. So make the <coughs> stormwater drain system as a part of city duty. We are just ignoring stormwater drain system is used as dumping ground, as whatever worst thing we want, bad thing we want to do in city is dump on the on the stormwater system. It should be other way around. Protect and make it the part of city's beauty. On your backside, behind your backyard, if you there is a stream flowing, would you not enjoy that? Rather than a nala with a stinking nala full of stench flowing. But this for us. Planners have to take this uh, beginning step with support of citizen and the managers. Then smart water management is again another challenge for the planners. 24-7 water supply is very, very critical of good quality water, 24-7. In my childhood, I stayed somewhere where there was no metering. We had never seen a water meter in our house. Electricity meter was there, but not water meter. So what we used to do was to fill up all the available pitchers, whatever receptacle we had, we will fill up when the water will come for about half an hour every day. And next morning, Majority of that will be um, uh, remaining full will be empty to fill fresh water, and many cities are doing that. And I feel so guilty for for that, but we have no option because next day sometime water will not come also. So we are not sure when the water will come. So all this 24/7 water supply, people should not uh, store water unnecessarily, and they should get fresh water. They should use the water and pay for what they are using. It will lead to lower consumption of water for the city as a whole and lower wastage of water, of course we have to improve the water supply, leakage issues are there and tariff which shall be paid for, then people do not respect what is free. If you say that water will come without meter for half hour every day or every two day whatever and then you cannot put any charge other than a lump sum charge because you cannot, you have not measured it and therefore the tariffs will be irrational. That is a critical thing, of poor people can be given some subsidy at the cost of the richer people, but then should not be free for the city as a whole, it must pay for itself. That's why we need to prepare a water plan for the city. The next challenge is sewage management. It's a typical photograph of any city. I mean, I have not named the city, it is downloaded from the website. Any city of India will have more, more or less similar uh, situation. <clears throat> and then, I mean, this is the way is 100% recycling and reuse of the sewage water should be our focus. And it is possible. It is possible and so many places we have seen that there is a great desire to have big sewage treatment plants of the order of 100 million liter per day, 200 million liter per day, costing you know hundreds of crores of rupees. But that is okay, money part is one part. But the more important is that where do you put such large STPs? Today there is no area available for putting up STP of this kind. And then to lay the, the larger area it covers, the larger the point then you have the pipes become bigger and the roads have to be dug up to lay the pipe and then it takes time and uh, people are made to suffer for all these times. Therefore small STPs of the order of 1 MLD or around that cost so small quantity amount and lot local innovations are also possible in management of small plants. You don't require very senior officers and technical personnel to manage. These small plants you can put up in the park only so that the recycled water and the final sludge can be used as manure in the park itself or in the neighborhood or roadside avenue plantation, construction sector, industry sector. And many examples are there. We have put in Jaipur there, in Delhi we have put in the new Motibag, in the NBCC project and elsewhere. 
so it is it is possible and we can nurture some i will show some photographs later tamil nadu has other states are also doing but then recovering the cost of uh, recycled water by selling the recycled water to the industry <coughs> you know agriculture of course benefits because the recycled water has got some nutrients which are good for the green and even industry and construction sector can pay for it and this project becomes very viable if it is used in that way these power projects you do not have to lay down big pipeline locally some industry some park some construction activity going on you don't have to load the city infrastructure for that so that is another benefit of then <coughs> smart sewer system bio digester the drdo have developed the technology for the defense in chhn and other places but it has become proved to be good for you know jugis or slum areas where you cannot easily lay uh, sewage pipes and so you can you know this uh, this is a beautiful technology where the bacteria will decompose the fecal matter into water and methane gas and methane gas with the quantity is large it can be harnessed to generate energy for cooking purposes and water of course can be used for greening the area or in flushing and so on so forth so for example if it there is a public toilet area and then you put that so the same water is i the treated water goes and leaves the flushing it's a wonderful thing people are trying in many places and uh, <coughs> there are managerial challenges are there but then concept being good managerial challenges can be resolved as we go along so the railways have tried with the biodigester in the in the in the rail coaches <coughs> with considerable success then so solid waste management you know in terms of swachh bharat we are very much anxious that all of us, of us have to support and give thought to how to keep the cities clean but then as i said that the clean swachh bharat in real terms i would say the recommend for your consideration it should not be leading to dumping the waste anywhere my fr the frontage of my house or my street is clean and i do not care where the waste goes is not the right approach we must work for a zero landfill and the research is required because all the time the managers of the solid waste program say that there are some inerts say 5% 10% which have to be dumped it is not good that inert the research is required to identify the ways of handling the last my last uh, refuge of the solid waste and maybe you can make bricks out of it non for non load bearing structure and whatever but then research is required and those who are into research or, or, or technological research must give attention to 100% recycling last mile can everybody knows how to make manure and how to make uh, the refuse derived fuel and from plastic for example we can uh, we can convert plastic without polluting the environment i would say plastic is no longer a, a danger for society as it was before considered before you can recycle the plastic but then there are some items stainless steel is there some e electronic items are there we have to work on those things and uh, work, see that there is 100% recycling and reuse then uh, disposable units are very effective and uh, for want of time i'll just show the photo but say that low cost things you know 50 lakh rupees for two ton unit does it mean sound too much? other than land of course land cost is you put in a park and you recycle this thing will generate manure which you in the park itself and sell that in the park so residents will buy and go home 5 rupee kg 10 rupee kg is not much they will happily take it also and from the same area they will be proud that from the same area uh, it was generated where they are they are living there and i think it will have <coughs> much better uh, sustainability than uh, the large projects where you have to heap it and segregation becomes a challenge the moment you pile up hundreds uh, 100 or 200 tons of waste in one place and then you think that we recycle i mean segregated it will be quite a challenge but locally small small quantity can be uh, segregated and recycled very fast then construction and demolition waste management with mbcc under the mood's guidance had urban development ministry's guidance had put up this uh, construction and demolition waste uh, recycling plant where the um, the demolition uh, the whatever the construction material demolition material came was recycled then and there and used in the same project itself to a great extent and without any need for transportation in a fairly uh, sustainable economically financially sustainable and technologically every way it was sustainable manner and so nothing went out you know you take the construction waste all over the city in trucks to a far away 
recycling plant is quite a nuisance and avoidable thing I would say. So zero landfill with 100% recycling is possible. These are some photographs of the solid waste plant. You see it looks so neat and clean. Inside also I will show to you. It is while operation it is like this but at the end of the day they will not only sweep but also wash it and it will look as clean as your kitchen. See it is like this only. These are the plants for solid waste. Look, look at how it looks. There is no stink at all there. And we can make it better also. There are one model is there. Many models are there. As I said before that smaller plants enable local innovations also. Even the local worker who is there may not be semi-literate or something. He can also show through in his expertise to make it still more efficient. Now friend, the financing, we hear that you know cities require financing, there is no money available and uh, there are reports to see that lakhs of crores of rupees are required for urban infrastructure. But as I, I, my belief is that urban uh, development creates wealth and therefore should pay for itself. You need to have uh, loans raised to, be, to make initial investment but it must be recovered. One model I am saying that any project increases the uh, See, for example, FAR can be more if you are developing a uh, metro project, the transit oriented development concept enables you to enhance the FAR, to make the mixed land use. And so the, the, uh, then you do divide the capital expenditure by the FAR which is benefiting from that and that is the betterment tax rate. So it will pay for itself. Divide on number of years. For example, you take one time development fees, people will make crib. Then you transfer part of that to the house tax and say that this is about development charge deferred over 25 years along with the property tax you have to pay. So people should not mind that much. And you take bank loan and start repaying from that betterment tax component. And so similarly, you rationalize the tax rates also regularly. Guidance value should be revised every year. This is actually, I would recommend that there is no need, generally speaking, to revise the tax rates, except of course there are cases where tax rates are abysmally low and not revised for years. That is one thing, they have to do that. For the general rule, look for rationalizing tax rates properties which are not in the tax net yet. Using the GIS mapping, identify such properties which are not in the tax net. You know, older time pop property shown as single floor, one floor. Over the years it has become three floor property, but registers have not changed well. Satellite imagery will tell us that this is a three floor property, register is showing a single floor property. You get the higher property tax without raising the tax rate. So like that, you know, with that kind of framework in hand, notify municipal bonds and ascertain that you have the, you have the uh, additional revenue escrowed into a proper account and then uh, repay through that escrowed account in the tax increment financing mode you definitely will become a viable project and for operational user charges and sale of the recycled waste can definitely give the uh, operational expenses plus user charges from those who are indirectly benefiting. For example, if your public transportation system is introduced and there are many people migrate to metro rail or BRTS or buses, then those who are not using these systems, they also get less crowded roads they are able to enjoy less crowded roads, they also should pay user charges though they are not using the road. Moreover, any cost saving should lead to, any modern technology should lead to cost saving. That also is an income for the project, including the replacement of old water pumps, replacement of old street lighting with efficient ones and so on. So that is how you recover the cost of financing of urban infrastructure it is definitely a viable thing, but this has to be worked out very carefully and people have to be educated about the whole concept and my faith is that people will cooperate very well. Then there are other components of smart city uh, planning for uh, uh, the future, e-governance, <coughs> street light management, uh, IT intelligent street light management saves on, so many cities are trying already, intelligent transportation management, <coughs> online public information system, walkable walkways, you walk safely to work, after walking for half kilometer or even less, you must be able to access a public transportation system, reach other side of your destination, where which should be either your workplace or again you walk to that place to reach safely. And public bicycles and non-motorized transport lanes are required. Um, some cities are trying already, it's a good sign, are already on the horizon. 
then public parking places are required for vehicles even residential area we should develop public parking here and there people park everywhere and it is becoming too shabby and crowded and unsafe you cannot leave the children to walk on the street unless you are like almost you feel like putting on a helmet when you are walking out so that is the position in many residential areas today <coughs> we should try to we should think of developing public parking and land acquisition through town and country planning act with the madras presidency areas gujarat and maharashtra have been doing with considerable success where you don't acquire land through land acquisition act but through the town and country planning regulations which is which model needs to be you know pursued seriously then opportunities i would say urban development as i said conceptually it is already i said urban development creates wealth and it is an opportunity by itself and in, in other frameworks also look india the world at large is now uh, look india uh, that is their philosophy that is their thinking which must capitalize on that through better cities up through this is an opportunity for us the large population i will say india as a whole i would recommend for the consideration and discussion that population is our strength population is not a burden we have been thinking often and discussing that you know population india is having too much population that is a problem i would recommend for the consideration of discussion that population is our strength because we are the unsaturated consumers people want to consume they are the people who want our services you know you produce produce, produce our products and services they are the producers also if there are there is nobody then who will produce and who will consume we do not want a sanitized city where there are no human beings at all you see so there is no traffic problem there is no problem of any kind we want people you know as I, as i said population growth rate is declining the population growth rate which of india as a whole used to be of the order of 25 to 30% every decade for last so many decades now it has come down to 18% or thereabouts so therefore the younger population is reducing the older people will continue to dominate the society and we should not be excited about all these things of course we should see that we have got a population is our strength and make use of them other opportunities people are willing to pay for services it is not right to think that people are always unwilling give good services assured services and explain to people why the charges are there and there are umpteen examples people have paid for water services bus services and i can give any number of examples our own countrymen are very cooperative in terms of user charges then your dpfi guidelines were notified about a year ago for planning including the regional world has come r has come the regional focus has to be given opportunity for us to integrate urban and rural area then bhuvan map is there which nrsc and iirs they have uh, they are propagating the bhuvan maps uh, which uh, amud sponsored program then basic statistics for local level development the ministry of statistics program national urban information system of the mud and the environment information system of the ministry of environment etc these are database is very critical issue for us we develop database it is a win all situation Uh, real time database a person is born then city population data should increase automatically by one number a child is born it goes up a person dies the death rate data is updated immediately these are all possible today national e governance program digital india skill india sugamya india make in india all these programs are offering umpteen opportunities for us to make our cities better and better planned our finance commission grants are going directly to municipalities and panchayats again the local bodies can capitalize from this opportunity so friends if you suggested action i am saying before concluding through some visuals that integrate cities and peri urban areas through notified development authorities we should be focusing for planning purposes city and peri urban area should be integrated to development authorities and there should be regional plans for development authority we should cover all the lands not merely the revenue lands but cover all lands include the railway land port land defense land cantonment and for planning purposes administration of the area will be excuse me with the different authorities cantonment area will be administered by the cantonment board port area by the port authority railway by the railways but for planning purposes how the rain water will flow through the area we cannot distinguish that in in the railway land it will flow i do not know how it will flow and so on so forth but so this is very critical and all authorities must join together so development authority should put on its board all those who are land owners of large areas in their area and make integrated plan which will be holistic uh, the sector plans have to be prepared in the in the development plan the primary framework is the drainage plan 
and followed by mobility plan, then settlement plan, sanitation plan, business plan, heritage plan, and so on and so forth. So sector plans have to be overlaid. Now the Bhuvan map allows the overlaying of uh, sector, uh, sectoral plans. There are maps of sector are available. You can generate also and lay one layer over the other and make a plan, then get the best out of the plan rather than you know, going backward, first you allow something to happen and then say how I link the mobility, how I link the business, how I link the sanitation. That is not fair. Start with drainage plan, then mobility plan and so on and so forth. Then integrate the smart city plan, the Amrut plan, housing for all plan, Hridaya plan, Swachh Bharat mission, Namami Gange, and so umpteen programs are there at city level how to integrate the same. So the city plan must take note of all these things. The municipality must be the driving force for all these programs and ensure that a common integrated plan is implemented in an integrated way, cutting across the institutional labyrinth and making the best. Of. So what is a challenge becomes an opportunity for us. Labyrinth of programs becomes a challenge today, but it can become a strength for us if we integrate the same well and manage it well. User charges we discussed already, online database we discussed. It is very critical. You want to develop a project, you need the data. Very first thing. And the database is not there for the cities, but framework luckily has come through BSLD, NUIS, NVIS, etc. The same can be you know, uploaded and populated regularly, it will become a wonderful thing. And census, including the CSO census of economic census and so on, these have to be you know, made use of by the cities also, by the villages also, in the city wards also. It is possible. Data is available, make use of it. That is how I would say that. Then prepare viable projects and viability, we have sustainability and viability we have discussed before. Then and float for PPP. Let municipality become the project promoter and you know monitor rather than doing it directly themselves. And in general, here and there they can do also. But once the project is defined in a sustainable framework, then it becomes good for PPP. And PPP means somebody's enterprise, risk taking capacity makes it all the more viable. Basic viability we decide. That if government were to do it, it is viable. Then somebody should make some money also, and, but it gives better service also. Then that is the trade-off. That better service, give better service, then government make better money. Okay, that is how it has to be. Then transfer the layouts, markets, parking lots, parks from state government and development authority to local bodies so that they can do land monetization to the extent wherever possible. For example, old markets are there. Or development authority develop the market. Give to the municipality. Let them make some money. Let them improve the market further by developing more floors and making more modern and so on. And you know, in the process, uh, land can be put to better use. In fact, old buildings, you know, as we have done in case of uh, New Moti Bar or East Kidway Nagar in Delhi, the MOUD did that through the NBCC. <coughs> that, you see, 10, 6 to 10 times more floor area was developed, modern buildings, part of that was sold out to, uh, you know, commercial activity and generated enough money to develop the remaining 90% or 95% plus surplus money also and the surplus money can be used for public purpose of variety of purposes. So that is the whole magic of urban development which creates wealth and uh, um, that will also, I mean, goes for villages also. And lot of research and development is required in urban management. Friends, some visuals I show before I conclude on transformation of cities through urban planning and management. So first photograph I show, just see and if you can make a guess, the city is the city of New York which took 150 years to look like, I mean, it's a huge, huge uh, economic and social development and, uh, but don't get nervous about 150 years, uh, that was an old story and uh, subsequently this city of Barcelona which is one of the uh, flag cities, flagship cities for us in terms of smart city program and uh, this program, see how the Barcelona was before and now how it is. It took 50 years, 150 became 50 and now cities are growing, uh, becoming smarter much faster. This Atlanta city, dense population, Atlanta is not a dense population, for two and a half million people it is occupying 4,000, more than 4,000 square kilometer area. Barcelona, more than that 2.8 million people with just 162 square kilometer area. See, in 40 years, Seoul has become like beautiful, no? the drainage has become so good. Uh, in this 30 years, Shenzhen has become like this. So 150 years become 30. Today you can do in even fewer years also. Because technology of construction, technology of management has become better. ICT makes it faster to develop a, a city. We our own, in our own countries, smart concepts are there in Hyderabad 
and some examples. See, Ahmedabad Kankadiya Lake, how it was, it was before, how it is now. Because there are so many things behind this, I could not capture in the photograph. There is a kid city, there are all kinds of beautiful developments around Kankadiya Lake now. And uh, the same thing around Kankadiya Lake, this toy train, which children enjoy. All poor uh, hawkers have been given beautiful shops. This is Indore Lake, before and after. See, what a would you not enjoy living in this city? See, Indore, what beautiful is. How many cities are trying now? I'm not saying the only example, but these are the flag bearing, flagpole, pro, flagship programs, are, efforts are there. You can do that. Sabarmati River, so many. I showed you one uh, rivulet uh, like this. This was the Sabarmati, was also not too different from that earlier. Now, look at the Sabarmati River front. It is generating wealth also. A lot of economic activity is happening on the river. Or whatever is invested in the pro project will be recovered more than amply in the few years' time only. Promenade in Kochi, see how nice it is. Probably these properties were not occupied for quite some time, good part of it. Now it is selling like hotcakes. So municipality will get property tax easily, rental income. So many people say economic activity will make government richer, people will be still more richer. So therefore this is the, this is the whole game plan of urbanization. <coughs> the street lighting of Baroda before and after. It pays for itself because of the improvement, uh, in energy savings, pollution is less. What more do you require? In a few years time you get back the investment. This is the magic of urbanization. And friends, I conclude by saying the growth story of India shall be written on the canvas of planned urbanization. And the visionary and capable planners and managers shall be the script writer of that story. So friends, with that, I thank you all very much. Thank you.